All right. All right, then, uh, yeah, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, uh, thank you very much for the, for the kind introduction and for having me here. It's a, yeah, it's a pleasure to be at this uh, great conference and give an update on our quantum simulation activities uh, at MPQ. And so, um, yeah, I'll continue this, this theme of, uh, of quantum simulation. And you just heard from Annabelle, like, what the, you know, what the, what the, about the amazing new things that we can do when we, when we get sort of microscopic and, uh, and uh, sort of single particle resolved snapshots uh, from many body systems. And I basically want to follow up on that sort of from the experimental side and tell you a bit uh, about what we're doing to get this sort of snapshot-like data uh, in, in, in fermionic systems that we create uh, with ultra-cold gases. And so, uh, no, before I, before I uh, talk about details, let me zoom out a little bit and ask this question, you know, why do we care specifically about like, working with uh, ultra-cold uh, fermionic systems? Uh, and I think there's sort of like two answers that, that one, can, one can give, right? Uh, on the one hand, there's sort of the, the fundamental academic interest in, in strongly interacting Fermi systems. So we can look at uh, sort of very different systems at very different energy scales, and uh, we often find sort of difficult like fermionic problems that we have to deal with. So for example, we can look at really systems in the sort of thermodynamic li limit at the, the electron volt scale and condensed matter systems, uh, or we can look at uh, smaller systems but at higher energies in, in atomic and nuclear physics, uh, or indeed we can go to uh, extremely large energy scales, for example, in sort of uh, relativistic uh, heavy ion collisions, and often what we find is that, you know, the, the most difficult things that uh, physicists encounter uh, are often, uh, can often be boiled down to solving uh, um, basically um, dyna dynamics or equilibrium states of uh, strongly interacting fermions. And so if we go to the, to the very bottom of the energy scale here, to the sort of pico-electron volt uh, range, and we work with ultra-cold atomic systems, uh, we have a nice situation where we have um, a, a, a fermionic quantum system where we have pretty unique observables, right? So we have uh, single particle sensitive detection. Uh, the dynamics happen on a time scale that we can actually resolve experimentally uh, in the lab, and we can really control kind of the complexity of these systems because we can control interactions and we can kind of dial in uh, uh, how, uh, how difficult these uh, systems are, uh, how difficult it is to, to solve these systems. And so the hope then is that we can be inspired by some questions that we encounter in these fields here, do some experiments with our ultra-cold fermions, and you know, perhaps not answer these questions, but maybe give back some inspiration uh, for, say, new observables to look at along the lines uh, which uh, Annabelle just described. And so uh, that's one reason to be uh, interested in ultra-cold fermions. The second reason is um, a little more practical, right? So we're all here basically developing quantum technology in the end with the idea that we, that we want to do something useful with that. And uh, one thing that we've already heard uh, mentioned a few times at this conference here is that these systems could potentially be useful for uh, sort of quantum chemical simulations, right? So basically where you have um, uh, a, a molecule that can be described by some, uh, by some uh, orbitals here, and basically for a particular spatial configuration of the, of the, of the uh, atoms, we want to know what is the ground state uh, of the electronic configuration. And this is a pretty simple problem to write down. You know, it's, uh, it's just a, a fermionic Hamiltonian with uh, quadratic and quartic terms here. Uh, but actually solving this is pretty difficult, and there's uh, at least the hope that uh, quantum mechanical systems that we can create in the lab can actually help us with this. And so people have uh, really started doing this, most notably with uh, superconducting qubits or, uh, or trapped ions. Uh, and there's really sort of, uh, yeah, some exciting progress in this direction. Um, but there is also sort of one fundamental problem, I would say, is that um, basically all of these systems um, we typically describe in, in terms of spin one-half models, right? And so we're trying to solve a fermionic problem with uh, spin one-half hardware, and so that means I need to map my fermionic creation operators to um, basically spin operators, right? And so I can either use uh, this Jordan-Wigner transformation or uh, a bravi kitaev uh, transformation, uh, but what you generically find is that sort of the the simple fermionic creation operator maps to something pretty complicated in a spin language where actually you get this sort of st string of spin operators running over your entire system, right? So this, this simple operator turns into like a non-local operation in the spin language. And this has some pretty um, unpleasant con um, consequences. Uh, so first of all, you can 
know, just write down uh, sort of the, the, all the terms that appear in the, in the Hamiltonian of a simple molecule. And I mean, there are many terms. This is to be expected. Uh, but you also see that there are some sort of pretty uh, uh, sort of nasty terms, right? So even in this uh, simple molecule here, you basically get terms that involve uh, six Pauli operators. And so you have these sort of um, uh, yes, uh, uh, no, uh, six operator strings. And you somehow have to approximate those and deal with those in your, in your simulation through tautorization or something. And so this is really a, a fundamental problem that it's pretty difficult to solve um, uh, basically fer intrinsically fermionic problems with spins. And so uh, one hope in our community is that if we control ultra-cold fermions more precisely, that we can perhaps contribute to this and kind of solve these um, sort of real-world fermionic problems in a, in a programmable way. And so what I wanted to do in this talk is to basically play on those two aspects of ultra-cold uh, um, fermions. And so I'll, uh, I'll talk a little bit about work that I did with the group of Selim Jochum at, at Heidelberg University, where we're more inspired by this sort of like fundamental questions. Uh, and we're actually looking at the, the fate of superfluidity and fermionic pairing in a few body system. And then in the second half, I'll give an update on our new uh, fermionic quantum simulation activities at MPQ and talk a bit about how we hope to build more programmable fermionic quantum simulators. So let me start with this, with this first part here. As I said, we basically um, sort of uh, got inspired by condensed matter problems. Namely, we know that uh, some materials exhibit superconductivity at low temperatures, and uh, at least in certain regimes, we understand this well. And we typically talk about systems in the thermodynamic limit where we have many particles. We even allow for particle number fluctuations. Uh, we don't consider boundaries. We consider homogeneous systems. Uh, and so one question that is uh, sort of quite exciting to ask is, uh, what actually happens when I shrink these systems down, when I really have a definite particle number and have small particle numbers, uh, and I say I have some single particle energy gap, does this physics of uh, pairing and superfluidity uh, survive? And so, yeah, simulating these uh, sort of paired fermionic systems involves uh, attractively interacting systems, and so this can be quite complicated. And uh, so what I wanted to do as a kind of warm-up is to start with something very simple and just look at uh, non-interacting particles, right? And so if I have uh, non-interacting particles, then the only thing that really matters are the quantum statistics. And so, as you all know, it can either deal with uh, bosonic particles, where I have a wave function that is uh, exchange symmetric um, under all permutations, and this basically allows all my bosons to sit in the same wave function and gives rise to Bose-Einstein condensation and so forth. Um, on the other hand, if I deal uh, with fermions, then I have to build an overall anti-symmetric uh, exchange anti-symmetric wave function. And so this gives rise to the Pauli exclusion principle and the fact that in a, in a system where I say have this single particle energy spectrum, I can only put one fermion onto, into each level here. And so this is very basic physics. And so we can ask a bit um, basically what consequences this anti-symmetrization has in a, in a continuum system. Uh, and uh, this is, again, very simple, something, something that everybody learns in their uh, undergrad physics education. We can simply think about uh, two spinless fermions sitting in a one-dimensional box. Right? Then uh, the first thing you do is to work out the single particle eigen, uh, eigenstates. Uh, these are just the plane waves shown here with the right boundary conditions. And if you want to now build a two-particle state out of this, uh, what you have to do is to just uh, basically put two particles into these lowest uh, lying eigenstates and anti-symmetrize the wave function, right? So you build this determinant, and you get your wave function out. And so now, well, what does this mean? Well, I can basically look at the wave function of the second particle for a fixed location of the first particle. So this is this one here. And, uh, the, you actually see the physically the, uh, the, the anti-symmetrization, right? So uh, the wave function has to go to zero here at the location of this first particle, and it has to change sign. sign. So I always have to have this zero crossing in the wave function. And this is, of course, true not only for that location that I drew, but basically wherever the first particle sits, the wave function of the second particle has to be such that it has a zero crossing at the location of that particle. And so you can look at uh, what this means for the density, so just the square of this wave function. And what you see is basically that there is this uh, suppression in the density uh, of the second particle at the location of the first particle. And this is known as sort of the, the Pauli hole, right? So basically uh, conditioned on this first particle here, there's a hole in the density uh, of the second particle. And this is, has nothing to do with any forces. It's just basically the symmetry of the ground state wave function uh, that enforces that. And so we, we wanted to do some uh, experiments to uh, kind of uh, look for these like spatial signatures of the quantum statistics. 
And so let me just give you a, a sort of a quick overview of this. So we're working with uh, ultra cold lithium atoms here, which are fermionic. Uh, and uh, for everything I'll, I'll talk about will be in the, in the 2D limit, so we use a vertical lattice here to basically def define a single plane and to freeze out motion uh, in the vertical plane. And uh, uh, we have the system at the focus of a, of a microscope here, which can image particles with high resolution, but which can also project uh, microscopic potentials. And for the work that I'm showing here, we're using just a single uh, moderately tightly focused tweezer here, which creates a single trap here at the center. Yeah. And so near the center, I can describe this as a, as a harmonic trap. So essentially what we're dealing with uh, is the physics of a 2D harmonic oscillator that just lives in this plane here, right? And we just care about the physics of a few fermionic particles living in this uh, harmonic oscillator. And so we, um, yeah, we wanted to get sort of like some microscopic insight into the nature of the states that we, that we find here. Um, we can't quite do this in situ because the, the densities are too high. But we um, developed a, a new imaging scheme that actually allows you to detect atoms in free space. So we can do this actually without cooling the atoms and without confining them. In particular, we can do this with very few photons. So we can get uh, basically images like this, where every white pixel here is a single photon that we detect on our, on our camera. And if we get, on average, 15 or 20 photons per atom, uh, we can identify uh, uh, individual particles in, in free space. And what this allows us to do is to basically prepare a state like this, uh, confine it to a 2D plane, uh, perform a term of flight measurement where we just let the particles uh, fly freely in this 2D plane, and then with a microscope from above take a picture like this where we just see the individual particles now in momentum space, right? Because the time of flight converts the initial momentum to the position in the image. And so what this means is that we have kind of these quantum gas microscopes available that we know from lattice systems in real space, now also in momentum space where we have single particle sensitive detection. And so uh, if we prepare six spinless, non-interacting fermions. These are the type of pictures that we get. Uh, this is now already labeled with momentum axes here in the units of the harmonic oscillator momentum. And basically, in each image, you can read out uh, the, six, uh, the, the 2D momenta of the six particles. And so this is basically taking snapshots from your many-body wave function. And so now uh, we can think about sort of, uh, you know, different uh, uh, analysis techniques to actually find out about correlations in these, uh, in these images. Uh, one thing that we followed for this particular example is something that uh, Marisch Geider from Warsaw um, suggested, which is to basically try to take many of such pictures and just align them to each other using this very simple protocol. And so what Marisch Geider and collaborators uh, proposed is the following protocol. Um, you take every image, you just shift it such that its center of mass lies at the origin, and then you rotate each image to basically align all the images to each other or to align them to a reference state. So we pick this um, so fivefold, uh, star with fivefold symmetry here as a, as a reference image, and we just uh, minimize the RMS angle uh, between the five outermost particle in, these, uh, in the arms of the star here. And so this is a snapshot-based method, right? So we do this for every realization of this experiment uh, individually. So we're getting our images here. And for every image, we basically apply this shift uh, and the rotation. And if you average enough of a, uh, maybe a few hundred or a couple of thousand uh, of these images, what you find uh, are patterns like this one here, right? So the, basically the particles don't sit in random locations uh, at all. Uh, you see some uh, clear structure here, namely that uh, you mostly find one particle near the center here, and then the five remaining particles you find on this uh, sort of five-fold symmetric structure on the outside, on this ring, um, um, gi yeah, giving you this sort of uh, petal shape here. Now, you might worry a little bit, right? You put in, you kind of put this in, right? Like, so you have this, put this five-fold uh, symmetric seed pattern in here, so maybe it's not surprising that your data actually looks like this after you do all these alignment steps. And so we do have to check that this is not an artifact of the analysis method. And one way to do that is to just uh, heat up the system. So uh, we, of course, try to prepare it as close to the ground state as possible, but we can just introduce um, sort of a little bit of excess energy just by modulating the system and introducing some uh, extra kinetic energy. And what you see is that um, if we just put in sort of a few uh, times the uh, harmonic oscillator energy, uh, this pattern disappears completely. So it's not an artifact of the analysis. In fact, it's actually uh, a signature uh, of the ground state here. So the ground state uh, exhi exhibits this pattern here. Uh, now, what is going on? So there are no forces, right? So the only thing that matters is the, the symmetry of the wave function. And it's exactly what I showed you in the beginning, namely that every 
particle has this Pauli hole around it, so basically the other particles try to avoid it on the length scale of the Pauli hole, uh, and the Pauli hole just happens to be not so much smaller than, uh, than the entire system here, so basically the particles preferentially uh, sit on this, uh, on the, in, uh, on this petal shape uh, to, basic to, to, um, uh, to, to give uh, space for this Pauli hole. And so now we can understand uh, how, this, how these patterns arise here, and uh, you know, we see this for six particles, uh, and the symmetry that you find depends on the, uh, on the particle number that you're dealing with. So for three particles, it's a little bit trivial, but we also see this for 10 particles, where you basically find three blobs on the inside and uh, seven blobs uh, on the outside. And so uh, this was quite nice for us to see, because you know, it tells us that we un using this microscopic imaging in momentum space, we really get access to correlations in a small continuum system. Now, everything I've talked about uh, was uh, about non-interacting fermionic systems, right? So perhaps not that interesting. And so the really interesting physics starts when you dial in interactions as, as well. And so for this, we take our 2D harmonic oscillator and fill it with a two-component uh, spin mixture, and we use a Feshbach resonance to dial in attractive interactions with a tunable um, uh, interaction strength. And so now what you might expect is uh, that your, your physics should be similar to what you find in a, in a superconductor. Uh, and there, the sort of the intuitive picture that we have for superconductivity comes basically from BCS theory that tells us what should happen or what can give rise to superconductivity is fermionic pairing, where a spin-up and a spin-down fermion uh, form a singlet pair across the Fermi surface. So basically that means we're expecting correlations between spin-up and spin-down atoms across uh, the, the Fermi surface here. Oops, excuse me. Do I want to shut down my computer? No. All right. Okay. So this is then the, the type of snapshot data that we can get, right? So we're taking these images now in a, in a spin-resolved way. And so we're again in momentum space where you can see all the 12 particles, six per spin state. And I've also labeled here the, with the dashed line with the, the Fermi surface for this uh, microscopic system. <coughs> And so now, of course, we're interested in, in correlations. So we're interested in the connected part of the density density correlation function in 2D. So it's a four-dimensional object. And so to represent this, what I'm going to do is we're basically going to fix um, a, a reference spin down particle. So the p down is going to be fixed here. And we're just looking at the connected part of the correlation function as a function of the up momentum only. So this is what's plotted in the, in the 2D plane here. And so what this basically tells you is the uh, the, the, the change in the spin-up density uh, that you get if you condition on detecting uh, a spin-down spin particle here. Right? And so if we have uh, no interaction strength uh, or no interactions, then we basically see noise here, which is what you expect, namely that the spin-up particles just don't care about where this uh, spin-down particle sits. If we go and uh, dial in stronger and stronger uh, attractive interactions, you do see some uh, correlation features emerge here, and it becomes quite clear in the strongly attractive limit that really you do, you do see a very strong correlation signal, namely uh, the correlations are suppressed here because of number conservation, and you have very strong positive correlation here on the exactly on the opposite side of the Fermi surface. So this is kind of uh, what you would intuitively expect from BCS theory, right, that spin down and spin up particles like to correlate across the surface, uh, across the Fermi surface, and essentially form zero momentum uh, pairs. And so uh, the nice thing is we can go back to the original uh, snapshots and actually look for the pairs that contribute to this correlation signal, right? So basically, we're taking many images here and just highlighting those pairs that would contribute to, to this correlation peak that I just showed you. And uh, no, sometimes you find such pairs even in the non-interacting system. This just happens by chance because the, the two spin components are uncorrelated. Um, however, if we go to attractive interactions, uh, we do find many more of these pairs, right? So it's quite obvious if you, if you highlight these pairs that really you, you do see in the raw data uh, these mini Cooper pairs. And so, uh, yeah, we, this was, uh, we, uh, we thought quite nice that we basically now microscopically can, can see the birth of these uh, Cooper pairs, and indeed we see a lot of the physics from the many-body system carries over into this microscopic limit. And so uh, this was work done in the, in the Jochen group, basically connecting sort of BCA or BCS superconductors to the microscopic limit. There's also other work ongoing there, so we also saw some uh, formation of shell structure and the precursor of, of a Higgs mode. 
uh, and most recently uh, the onset of hydrodynamics in, in few particle systems, but uh, I just in invite you to look at the applications here. And so this was uh, work done uh, in Heidelberg. And so now in the, in the last few minutes of the talk, I basically want to uh, switch gears and uh, tell you about the new experiments that we're building at MPQ. So we're basically uh, building two new Fermi gas microscopes uh, at the moment. Uh, one is this Uniran machine here. So there we're looking to basically combine optical tweezer and optical lattice technology to really assemble many body states in, a, in an optical lattice and to perform measurements using random unitaries. The other effort is the Fermi QP machine, where we're um, actually trying to build a hybrid digital analog quantum simulator with the idea of combining analog Fermi Hubbard simulation with the digital gates. And so we've been uh, busy setting up these two labs. Uh, so um, we basically we're building two very similar uh, machines. So uh, they feature a very small vacuum uh, system. So we shrunk down the size of the machines uh, quite a lot. Uh, we've been busy setting up our, our laser systems, uh, our, our vacuum system. And on the Uniran machine, we recently got our, our 3D mod, and the <coughs> FermiQP machine uh, will follow soon. But uh, no, rather than telling you technical details uh, about this, I want to talk a bit about the concept of these experiments, and let's go to the, to the Fermi-QP machine. And so, as I said, the idea here is to have a, a hybrid quantum simulator, with a basic insight being that with ultra-cold atoms, we actually have like huge quantum systems, right? So we can deal with hundreds or thousands of particles that we can all detect individually, and we can propagate those coherently for hundreds of tunneling times. So it's a very like, attractive quantum system uh, to look at. But what we don't have so far is sort of universal control over these, or a circuit or gate-based description of the dynamics as we do for other uh, quantum computing or, or quantum information uh, pr um, uh, platforms. And so uh, what we would like to do, basically, is to combine these two worlds for mobile fermions. In practice, what that translates to is that we're building a new Fermi quantum gas microscope. So we're looking at 2D Fermi, uh, Fermi Hubbard models under a microscope. And we're combining this with this, uh, these optical super lattice techniques that uh, we've developed in the last few years, where we use basically uh, um, lattices of different wavelengths to uh, create these tunable double well potentials, which give us access to really like controlled local dynamics uh, in, these, uh, on, in, in these double well potentials. And we will also capitalize on other techniques that we've developed, uh, for example, this uh, spin resolve detection uh, in the optical lattice here. Uh, now, what is new that we want to combine this analog Fermi Hubbard simulation with uh, single and two qubit gates, really to get universal control over the spin degree of freedom that takes part in this quantum simulation? The idea for the single qubit gates is that we want to be able to basically go in with a tightly focused laser beam and drive Raman transitions on the spin degree of freedom taking part in the, in the Hubbard model. And so this will be a combination of basically global uh, microwave and, and RF addressing uh, with these tightly focused Raman beams to really flip spins individually in the, in the optical lattice. And so uh, this is quite challenging. Like, you know, we, this spin flipping has been demonstrated, but not really sort of coherent control over individual spins. So we're going to have to, I think, yeah, reach some new um, uh, regimes in terms of um, phase coherence of this Raman laser and of the uh, phase stability of our, uh, of our uh, Fermi system. These are the, the single qubit gates. Uh, the two qubit gates are going to be implemented using this double well architecture that I mentioned. Um, so many of you will know that if I have some isolated state here, if I turn on some tunneling and some interaction, I can engineer these super exchange interactions. And by uh, running the dynamics in the double well here for a suitable amount of time, I essentially get a, a square root swap gate where I go from a product state to an entangled state. So I can use the dynamics in the double well to controllably locally uh, generate entanglement. Now these uh, collisional gates do have some downsides, so they're, they're pretty slow, right? We're expecting this to be on the order of 100 hertz or so. Um, but what is nice about the system is that we can basically make hundreds or thousands of these, of these double wells in parallel, so you can actually imagine driving um, you know, a, yeah, a few hundred of these uh, entangling operations really in parallel. Uh, you will have then correlated noise between them, uh, and you only need to basically optimize a few parameters to, uh, to really get uh, good entangling operations uh, on many sites. And um, it has been demonstrated already by John Lapan's group that this can work actually quite well. 
So then, uh, what's the idea? What can we do with this? So as I mentioned in the beginning, we really want to look at uh, hybrid quantum circuits. And so this is, means we want to have these, this digital control via the gates and the analog quantum simulation, not only on the same platform, but within the same sequence. Um, so you could imagine a scenario where you initialize some uh, product state that we can initialize with a low entropy, so it could be a band insulator or a spin polarized gas. Then we use a gate, a gate sequence to program in some interesting initial states. So this could be some spin structure or some uh, sort of uh, singlet covering or something like that. And then we can use that uh, programmable state as an input to uh, analog Hubbard evolution and then uh, use our gate sequence again to perform a basis rotation before we image and measure. Right? So then you can really uh, combine these elements uh, at will in one sequence to, um, yeah, to, to look at, at new physics. Uh, and so this is not just our thinking. So, um, for example, uh, Peter Zoller and co-workers recently uh, did a lot of work on this uh, fermionic quantum computing, where they actually showed that they can basically take any, any four-body operator, uh, any fermionic four-body four operator, and decompose this into a sequence of, of tunneling pulses and interaction pulses. So um, this idea of sort of applying this uh, Hubbard evolution also in a, in a gate-like fashion uh, is gaining traction. And indeed, they show that this can be used to uh, perform one of these sort of very simple uh, variational optimization uh, protocols in a, in a chemical problem. And so let me, uh, I think, just give you basically one idea about what we can do with uh, such a programmable Fermi Hubbard simulator. Uh, so you know that uh, in our field, we've been trying to get to lower temperatures in the Fermi Hubbard model here. On the experimental side, we've been stuck a bit at uh, sort of uh, temperatures that are a little too high for our liking. Uh, on the other hand, our theory friends have been hard at work sort of calculating what happens down here uh, at zero temperature. And you will hear, for example, from Uli Scholberg that they can now do very nice calculations at, at zero T that predict in what geometries you actually find this D-wave superconductor. But what is still difficult for them is to actually do per basically perform calculations at finite temperature. And so one thing, uh, one interesting thing would be to, uh, to kind of bridge this, this, this gap in the, in the temperature. And uh, so Ignacio Sirac and co-workers came up with a, with a hybrid uh, analog, uh, sort of hybrid classical analog um, algorithm recently to do this. The, the idea is that basically your, your classical computer sort of, you want to build a thermal ensemble on your classical computer, which is hard. And what you can do is to basically create um, candidate states. Uh, and then you want to be able to program those candidate states into your quantum simulator and actually evolve them under the Hamiltonian of interest for a certain time. And then from the dynamics, you can actually figure out what the weight of that state in a thermal ensemble should be. And so basically, you go back and forth between your classical and your quantum machine to, to build a thermal ensemble in numerics uh, at, 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 uh, at a basically chosen energy density. And so this is the type of algorithm that we're interested in, thinking that uh, basically if we can use we can program uh, product state, or we can prepare product states at very low entropy. What's been hard for us is to prepare these correlated states here. And so if we now have a programmatic way of going from a product state to these correlated states, perhaps we can actually also reach lower temperatures. And so the, yeah, this is sort of on the menu for us. So of course, developing the experiment, also thinking about uh, new uh, yeah, theoretical schemes, for example, we can think about uh, variational uh, 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 states for the Fermi Hubbard model, um, and this is what we'll be pursuing in the next uh, year or so. I didn't talk much about the, the Unirand experiment, so uh, just very briefly, basically, we want to assemble these optical lattices systems and use the toolbox of random unitary measurements to uh, yeah, get new access to many body physics in, uh, in, uh, in, in Fermi Hubbard systems. And so, let me just very quickly announce, uh, acknowledge the team here, so both the Unirand and FermiQP team. Uh, Jin and Janet are here in the audience. They are uh, showing posters, and they'll also be happy to answer questions. And so with this, yeah, thank you. OK, thank you, Philip. Um, questions? It's a question about momentum correlations. Yeah. Very nice result. Can you guys do a quantitative comparison to say BCS wave functions of these correlations? Uh, yes, we can. So um, basically, we so we haven't really compared the wave functions. So we, okay, uh, what we compare to is basically. Um, 
what you would expect from just basically having molecules, right? So if you go to the very strongly attractive side here, at some, at some point you should be able to basically describe this as just a, a gas of bosonic dimers. Uh, but basically for the interaction regimes that, we, that we've looked at, that doesn't match very well. So there's still a very clear modification of these correlations from having a, a, the, the Fermi surface. Um, so this, uh, yeah, this we haven't done. So what we what we did look at is this this Richardson model, right? So basically, there's uh, there's the Richardson model, which um, actually helps you describe exactly these types of systems, where you have finite particle number, uh, and uh, th we also saw that sort of qualitatively that matches, but we haven't really seen a sort of like quantitative match there. Um, so it would be interesting to look a bit more. Uh, basically quantitatively into how you can describe these correlations. Um, there's of course basically the, 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 the trap actually gives you an additional energy scale compared to BCS theory and so that actually shifts the point at which you expect pairing. But within BCS theory you basically expect it for any attractive interaction. That's not true in the trapped system. There you need some finite interaction to actually get the pairing. Okay. So Maybe this is a, a silly question, but uh, you know I love Rydbergs, and I guess I wonder if this uh, kind of a continuum system in a trap would be amenable to Rydberg dressing, in the sense that you haven't reduced your kinetic energy scale with a lattice, and so maybe you could see something interesting on the time scales before you get an avalanche. Um, okay, so to, to in particular to get long range interactions. Yeah, um, yeah perhaps we. We didn't really think about that, yeah. So I, I think it's just a, in, in general a technique to really see, uh, basically to do microscopy in, in continuum systems, right? Uh, what I've shown you is only momentum space. What we can also do by now is that we basically do two, uh, a two-step evolution in this harmonic potential, and then you also get this sort of magnified version of your real space wave function. So you could also use this to then see uh, basically real, state, real space correlations in a Rydberg dress system, yes. Good. Is there another question? Okay, I see none. So let's thank Philip and all the speakers in the session.